Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to LHC's first webinar. I hope uh, you're all well and keeping safe. The IOQ webinars, I think, have been a big success and something that's um, really positive to come out of the recent situation with COVID. I think it's provided a wider access for people to technical information and it, it's meant that branches can, uh, uh, we can visit other branches meetings as well. So I think that's been a really good thing. I joined a webinar earlier in the week and I found the information really informative and uh, there was a lot to take away from that session. It stimulates discussion and I think some questions. I'm expecting the webinar again today to do that for us. So I'd like now to hand over to Lee Emmett of MSA and Doug Kemp from Rig Systems. Okay, so thanks very much guys uh, for joining. Um, so my name's Lee Emmett, I'm UK Key Account Manager for MSA Safety. I'm joined by Doug Kemp, who's the Director of Rig Systems UK. So pretty much what Will said, you know, this strange time has given us all a bit of extra time to spend, you know, attending these webinars. And as Will says, you know, you can tune into the other branches, which has been great. But I think we, you know, we, we appreciate you've heard many of these types of presentations virtually over the last 12 months. So we're going to try and do things a little differently by having a more open discussion with some key questions that we come across, you know, weekly, daily within the industry. We'll also have some, you know, sc uh, screens to go through as well, but I think we want to try and leave it as open as possible. And then obviously if you've got any questions as you go, please feel free to, to ask, them at the, ask them at the end. Okay, so just a very brief agenda today, uh, just do a very brief introduction of the, the two companies so you understand where we come from and, and what, what sort of experience we bring, bring to the table. We then just want to go through, you know, what is a confined space and then ultimately how do we classify and why do we classify a confined space. And I think then at the end, you know, what we really want to look at as well is, is COVID-19 and what an impact it has with that because we see some cases day by day that probably don't come up often in, in, in risk assessment, but there's a practical explanation as to why we need to consider these. So we'll go through that as we go. And then finally, at the end, as I said before, we really welcome some, some questions. So just a brief introduction on MSA. So who are we? Well, in short, MSA stands for Mine Safety Appliances. Uh, we're a global safety equipment manufacturer who have been involved in safety for over 100 years. Our first major development and a world's first was designed by our two founders, John Ryan and George Dyke, who alongside Thomas Edison designed the first ever miner's cap lamp following terrifying accident statistics in the mining world. As we fast forward 100 years, we're now one of the largest critical safety equipment manufacturers in the world with over 7,000 employees in 44 countries. In the UK, our Global Fall Protection Centre of Excellence is in Devizes, Wiltshire. And when things are back to normal, we hope that we can get you guys there for, um, for a meeting and show you around. So just to be brief a bit more about the products that we, we make. So we manufacture portable gas detection, breathing apparatus, fall protection, head protection, and fixed gas and flame protection. So when we talk about confined space working, we've really got you covered, especially with our partner, Rig Systems when it comes to confined space and working at height. So I'll just pass it to Doug for a brief introduction on Rig Systems. Yeah, hi, um, Doug Kemp, Rig Systems. We are a uh, training company predominantly now. Um, we've been training in the quarrying industry for probably 15 years. Uh, generally, well, we started with the, with the industry with confined spaces uh, in response to uh, an accident in the Southwest uh, where it was identified that there were some gaps uh, in ability in accessing some of the plant and equipment that, that tend to be around site. We're an IRATA training company, obviously much the same as most of the other companies, City and Guilds training company, uh, GWO, uh, I, I, you know, ISO accredited. It, we, we can train through trailers, we can train on site. But, but the main thing we did with quarrying industry was that we looked at all the spaces that were available and realized that it doesn't really link up with with the training that was actually on site uh, and the, the sort of tried to take away some of the problems where the guys had to make a cognitive leap between the training that they'd had and then applying it to the plant and equipment that they were working in. 
Um, so we came up with a thing that we call CONSAR, um, which has been run out now across most of the big uh, mineral extractive companies in the UK, which was designed to address some of those issues. So just, I think it's fair to say that since the pandemic began, we've all had to adjust the way we plan and execute all aspects of our work. And today we want to be able to just go through some common questions when it comes to confined space in our sector, but also want to discuss the impact that coronavirus has had uh, when it comes to the working. So we'll include towards the end how we sanitise certain bits of equipment and, and, and basically the fact that we've introduced extra measures for sanitation and how is that potentially an increased risk when working in confined spaces. So I just want to start by going over definitions of a confined space, which come out of the confined space regs and the ACOP because I think there's still a lack of understanding of the detail behind these statements, which define a confined space and how we practice them within our businesses. We, we actually see so many situations where a confined space is not classified correctly, if at all. We'll cover that a little bit later anyway. But it can have massive implications if things went wrong and your rescue plans may not be prepared or sufficient. Classifications have a direct correlation to what training equipment you need for such a scenario. We've had so many clients recently who have identified themselves internally that they may have hundreds of confined spaces on one particular site. But when you really delve into the definitions and understand if there are any foreseeable specified risks inherent or introduced, you often find that it's nowhere near what they actually think. And to be fair, the space is just a horrible and dirty spaces with specific control measures. So by definition, Confined space is any place, including any chamber, tank, vat, silo, pit, trench, pipe, sewer, flue, well, or other similar space in which, by virtue of its enclosed nature, there arises a reasonably foreseeable risk. Okay, so we look at it a little bit further. There are two defining features in order to class a space in a confined space. One, they are places which are substantially enclosed, but not always. Two, there is a reasonable foreseeable risk of serious personal injury from hazardous substances or conditions within the space or nearby. The confined space ACOP defines those risks, which must be assessed as specified risks. And I think one of the biggest challenges is to understand what do we mean by foreseeable specified risks. We've all seen the statements, but it's really what is behind them and what actually the, the risks we have on our site. So I'm going to pass it to Doug just to go through the um, FSRs. So, uh, so uh, solids or entrapment in free flowing solids. Um, so sometimes this gets confused on sites um, with getting hit in the head with a rock. Uh, now getting hit in the head with a rock is a working at height problem. Um, getting buried in, in sand or fines or something like that. So you can't reach in a, a respirable atmosphere that that's how that would fall. So, uh, I mean, the, some of the bulk containers and stuff that, 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 that are around sites, some of the, um, uh, some of your stockpiles, you know, could potentially fall into this, um, because of its ability to flow. So what we're looking for is anything that can flow and move from sort of a solid state. To a liquid state. So there have been some accidents involving, um, uh, sort of mezzanine uh, material in silos and, and sort of these places. This tends to be fairly easy one to spot, um, e even around some of the, the, the quarry and min mineral extractive sites, um, because, because it lends itself to being very obvious. Okay. Again, though, it's, it's, that, it's that serious risk. You know, it's this, it's, are we going to actually harm people with it rather than, rather than something that might get your feet a little bit dirty. Okay. So this is, this could be anything from gas welding um, within a space or, you know, accidental release of a settling or something in yeah. space through to kind of de-searing environments that might be say dust storage or paper filler or something for, for coatings. There's, there's a few opportunities uh, across the sites and some of them might be a little bit more subtle than, than kind of on the first offset. So sometimes, sometimes we can create problems so we got a lot of iron and metal and stuff on these sites um, so any kind of interaction with acid can produce hydrogen um, so, so that can be a problem it, it really boils down to having a good risk assessment or you know a good initial survey of, of the conditions on the site and whether or not it's going to occur 
Loss of consciousness or asphyxiation, gas, gas, gas vapor, or lack of oxygen. oxygen. All right, so gas welding, again, you know, this, is, no, this is a thing. Stick, stick welding, welding, anything with the potential to change that atmosphere from a respirable atmosphere to an irrespirable atmosphere. When we look at a lot of the enclosed spaces, uh, crushers, um, dryers, um, you, you know, even some of the back of some of the big plant that you've got is whether or not you can ensure there's enough airflow moving through through the process to avoid this situation occurring. Now, there, now there, again, there are some that, that might not be so obvious. Um, obviously, you've got decomposition of organic material. So some of, some of the underground services, some of the, the areas where you've rooted rivers away from your sites, uh, these, these can potentially be a problem. And then on the limestone sites, you've got the potential release of CO2 as part of that lime, limestone decomposition. So again, that can sump up. It's a heavier than air gas, and that can cause problems. It, it, it's the same process, though, that the really robust risk assessment at the first instance and trying to identify what those hazards are. Uh, and then you can sort of ping those areas and make sure that you guys aren't working in them. Again, a, fair, a fairly easy one. Again, this is potential for drowning. Often gets confused with having water in a space. Now, having water in a space is much, much more likely in a wet process or something like that, in dry plant, wash plant, something like that, much more likely to fall into the one above, okay? Whereas the potential for drowning is, is going to be a, 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 lot, a, a lot more specific to things like sewers, okay, or, or, or flood drains or somewhere where there's no immediate escape if there's a sudden ingress of a large volume of water. We're not talking about a two inch pipe that, that might be used as a drain pipe uh, feeding into the bottom of a process somewhere or for dust control. That That's not gonna have that potential to go from a sort of safe space around your ankles immediately to somewhere that you can't escape from. And then loss of consciousness due to increasing body temperatures. Now, this this is this can be a problem. Um, in some spaces, it can be very easy to get rid of. So, if we look at a cement site, a cement kiln, or something like that, or a mill, uh, the 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 limestone coming into it's very very hot. You know, the media balls are moving around. It's it is it is a very hot place. Uh, the simple solution is to let it cool down. Uh, unfortunately, because of production issues or whatever, then there seems to be some resistance to this. But you know, if we can get rid of the foreseeable risk, then it's not a confined space. So if we can cool it down, if we can get that process to be, you know, to, to a reasonable background temperature, so people aren't at risk of heat exhaustion or heat fatigue, then, then that will make that space a safe space, which is what the thrust of the regulation is. Identifying it in operation and signing it up and saying, well, look, we don't want anybody to go in there in operation. That's, you know, that's perfectly sensible. But once that heat's gone and can't return, then, then that problem goes away effectively again though you know if, if we're on the back end of a hot process so it could move through because it's not properly shuttered down or or the heat can move from one area to another so we can transition that problem across then then that then that also needs to be looked at so the isolation might need to extend or the isolation shutdown closing might need to extend further back in the process to ensure that that can't migrate from one space to another all right I think, I think just to add to that, Doug, as well, you know, one point that, that's come up quite recently, actually, is that um, this Latoto has been included as one of the foreseeable specified mm. risks. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we, we talked about this the other day, you know, and, and it's quite a dangerous thing to, to sort of include as one of the uh, foreseeable specified risks because actually it's, it's more of a control measure rather than one of the specified risks. And I know of one particular company that was advised because the Latoto is not controlled, it is deemed a high-risk confined space. So it's more of a, a point that it's not one of the foreseeable specified risks. It actually is a, one of the control measures. So I just thought I'd mention that because it seems to be rearing its head uh, a couple of times. Sorry, Lee, just, just as on another point there as well. Just because just, just because, because, just because not, not one of the fierce stable risks, risk, you might still have to risk it out the hour of the hour of it, 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 it. The, the, the total is a big thing inside. Um, um, but, but also, but also it's biological, biological risk, risk rats, rats, or, you know, you know, contaminated contaminated groundwater process. process. So you, you so have you further have problem. Further problem. Okay, so, so this was introduced in the uh, Confined Space Regs ACOP when it was uplifted in 2014, and it's a flow chart. So it's still the biggest question that I get as a training provider when I arrive at site is, God, is it a confined space or not? So this flow chart was introduced. It, it, it's a very good flow chart. 
Uh, and it's very, very simple. And I think that's the key to, to all of this is to try and keep everything as simple as possible. So people have a very binary approach to whether or not it is or it isn't, or it's got to be classified as such. Um, remember, though, and it is worth remembering, even if it's not a confined space, it probably falls under every single reg apart from the confined space regs. So you, there, there are a lot of other things that are worth controlling. Now, whether or not we introduce the extra controls for confined space, sometimes it's a bit immaterial. So we start off at the top of this flow chart with, you know, is it substantially enclosed? So why not totally enclosed? Because, because heavier than air gases can sump up, can be in an open pit or an open trench and might not necessarily be, be on an obvious place that's a confined space. A working example could be a, an office with a petrol generator in it or a room that's just been spray painted with an oil-based paint. Um, that that could potentially, because of its substantially enclosed, be, become a confined space. So then we follow the system down. Is there risk of one of the following? And then it just goes through and lists those five risks that we've just talked about. Um, if we can identify one of them immediately, for example, um, a mill in operation, then yes, it's it's very very hot in there. Loss of or loss of consciousness arising from increased body temperatures there all the time. If it's not there necessarily, we then have to look at whether we're going to introduce some kind of hazard as, as part of what we're doing within the space. Now, some of the common tasks are, you know, replating and welding and cutting and burning. And, and these often will increase the risk of something occurring within that space. So that would lead us off then, yeah, it's a confined space. We need to do something about it. Um, you'll note though, until produced fumes have been vented. So in the same kind of in the same kind of uh, vein for this, we can look at a space and we go, well, okay, if we take away the substantially enclosed nature, perhaps it's not a confined space. If we take away the specified risk, perhaps we can declassify it and not have it as a confined space. Whereas if you immediately die when you go in there in operation, it doesn't necessarily mean that once it's cool and cold and can't restart, that it's still going to maintain that same level or require that same level of control. Okay, if you work your way through this and get to know at the bottom, well, it's not a confined space. But it doesn't mean you haven't got a Kosh problem, a Pure problem, a Lola problem, or some other problem that needs to be addressed, you know, when you let a, a worker into that space. We're just going to touch on some classifications um, of confined space. Um, and there's one question that myself and, and, and Doug, well, Doug, Doug, I want to ask him directly, you know, because we, we talk about classification of confined space on all sites and, and we manage the risk from there. But I suppose, you know, when we look at the ACOP, the ACOP doesn't classify that we have to do this with confined spaces. So, so my question to Doug is, why do we classify spaces when the ACOP doesn't? So it, it all boils down to safe systems of work. And, and there's a lot of things that, that are involved or wrapped up inside a safe system of work. Um, the one that everyone points to is the national classifications used by the water industry. So when we look at, um, for example, city and guilds based training, um, it, it always talks about low, medium, high risk, or it talks about uh, NCs. So you see a lot of companies referring back to the NCs, especially training companies, because they don't, they don't, really have anything other to follow than, than this. This is the first sort of national set of classifications to be able to control one industry's uh, myriad hazard across the whole country to give, give the whole industry a way of either setting a training level or setting um, a level of competence, shall we say, to be able to enter a work or carry out in within this space. Now, attached to this set of classifications, there's also recommended gear lists, recommended minimum equipment lists, recommended team sizes, uh, recommended you know, amount of training, all sorts of other good stuff. Um, so if we start NC1, NC1 was a, a very small pit. And then at the other end of the spectrum, NCX is now is a relatively new one that's been introduced. NCX is a uh, space within a space. The problem falls for the extractive industry that when we start following this, NC3 that sort of sits in the middle is where somebody comes off of a vertical attachment line to move traverse into a space. Well, if we look at a dryer or if we look at um, a washer barrel or if we look at any of the processes that you guys have, uh, there is no opportunity for tripod-based vertical entry. Everything is crawling in or climbing down or climbing through. So immediately it defaults to that NC3. And at NC3, it's all about... Uh, moving away from self-rescue to assisted rescue and having a BA team as backup. So you often see people advising, well, we need a BA team for this. 
Never mind the fact that it's an open-ended tube, effectively, if you take the adequate controls and you could walk straight out of the machine, they immediately go, well, you're off the line. My default mindset is if you're off the line, NC3, therefore these, apply, these rules apply. So here on the screen, we've got three very different images uh, in terms of uh, associated risk and in, in terms of classification. So within, within your industry or within, within the extractive industry, we need to we do need to set a kind of threshold for where we're going to train. If we're not training our guys to use uh, airline or, you know, um, you know, very, very high RPE protection. So 2000 plus RPE protection airlines and uh, SCBA and all this good stuff. Um, then we have to set some kind of threshold. So if we take that middle picture as a, as it's a water tank, but if we take it as an oil tank, let's say, or a bitumen tank or a fuel tank, there's a, there's a lot of hazards around that space. So the reason to classify would be the power mixer on the left really is a very simple entry. It's no more than half a meter deep. It's got good ventilation all around. It's very, very easy to recover somebody from. We don't have to commit anybody else in the space. So we're following the confined space regulations guidance about protecting anybody that needs to put a measure back in to, to recover someone from the space. But if we look at the middle picture, um, oh, that's very different. We, we've got a uh, working at height potential problem there. We've got um, a limited access size potential there. We've got a contaminated atmosphere potential there. And the, the, the general level of training that we give to guys, uh, fitters and such on quarries and, and on these sort of sites, doesn't really meet the requirements to both enter and control that space, but also to, to sort of safely recover someone from that space if, if the specified risk is realised. So th this is where classifications are actually quite useful. What's not so useful is trying to default to another industry's classifications because that leads us into that world of, well, everything's Im 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 massively dangerous when it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. If we look at the entry on the right-hand side, this is an entry into a cement mill. Um, yeah, when the cement mill's running or when the cement mill's not been adequately cooled down or when the media is still in there, yeah, that's a potentially very dangerous place to be. Um, but when it's when the fan's running, but it's latotoed out and it's been left to fully cool down and the media's extracted, it's a big empty metal tube with a massive throughput of air. Where's the specified risk? The specified risk as it exists now is not necessarily the specified risk as it exists ready to work, if, if that makes sense. So we could have a, a classification of that when it's when it's in its hot state and say, well, look, we're going to call that high risk. Um, but when it's in its cold state and ready to work, we're going to say, well, that's just maybe a restricted space. We don't necessarily want people inside that space without an understanding of where they are and what they're doing. We still need them to take adequate controls for the other things that are going to affect them. Um, but the one in the middle, there's really nothing we can do to that at the level of training that we provide to, to fitters and such, um, that they could make that safe in any way, shape or form. Does, does that make sense, guys? So I know we're flicking through quite quickly, um, but, but to be honest, I want to just touch on you know, the impact of COVID-19 that has had on confined space work. And there's a few examples we'll, we'll go through, but also the potential impact it has on critical elements of PPE. You know, Doug mentioned there certain types of equipment that you need for certain entries based on, on the level of risk. But we've, we've sort of seen um, a lot of hand sanitizers and cleaning agents that are available um, at the moment and predominantly alcohol-based, which is great to kill the virus, but can have a significant impact on the integrity and reliability of the equipment that you use. So, First one uh, I'd like to discuss in a bit more detail is, is a gas detector. So confined space entry, uh, pre-entry assessments, you would you'd monitor the atmosphere by using one of these. And then as an entrant, you would potentially have one of these um, to continuously monitor. And the idea behind this is if it gets to a particular level that's dangerous to the user, it would alarm, which gives the, the user an indication, an alert to, to get out of the space. But that said, if the sensors in these monitors are exposed to alcohol um, and other cleaning agents such as chlorine and silicon, the sensors can become poisoned. So what do we mean by that? So if a sensor is poisoned within a gas monitor, they lose their sensitivity to the actual target gases that they're supposed to be measuring. So that a problem could arise in a confined space where the detector may not do its job and alarm to alert the user that there is a problem. Obviously, if that was to happen, we know it could be a very severe problem. 
In terms of cleaning this type of, of kit, you know, we, we recommend mild soap with warm water, with a cloth, um, rub without adding excessive amounts of water, especially in the sensors. We have um, approved cleaning um, products that you, that you can use, and, and I'll happily share all the guidance documents on this after, after the event. Um, but it's really crucial to make sure that you get the right one and make sure there's no alcohol base within 0.1% volume, um, which would cause, cause a problem for this. So we're continuously sanitizing our hands uh, due to the current situation. One thing you really need to be mindful of is when handling these gas lighters, because you're still likely to have alcohol residue on your hands from anywhere between two and 10 minutes, depending on the concentration. So even after sanitizing your hands and picking this up within that time, you could still poison the sensors. So it's just be mindful to sort of leave it a good 15, 20 minutes, I would say, before you, you pick up the monitor. Some of you know that it's a legal requirement uh, to calibrate these gas monitors every six months, but based on the increased exposure of chemicals, like products such as the alcohol gels, we recommend bump testing a little bit more frequently to ensure its functionality and it is working as it should. So just in brief on that, a bump test is a pre-use check where you expose the sensors to a target gas out of a cylinder to ensure they're performing correctly. Irrespective of COVID, 19 MSA recommend bump testing before use, but it is not a legal requirement. It's just another control measure for critical equipment when in confined spaces and dealing with COVID-19. I suppose at this point, I can only answer for MSA gas detectors, and we can't obviously comment on other manufacturers, but as I say, I'm happy to share all guidance afterwards of this. So things like harnesses, um, very similar. Uh, I can only answer... For, for MSA, um, but we would use the mild soap with warm water. And it's really crucial that it's soft cloth because they're a webbing based product and you would clean all the webbing and buckles. But to be honest, and I think, you know, in, in most businesses that we work with at the moment, personal issue, PPE, things like this, rather than shared, obviously limits the potential of, of, of cross contamination and transmission. Again, happy to send you the information specifically. So last thing really I just want to talk to you about is the, um, and it's more about food for thought this, because we've all become accustomed to having these types of hand gels, um, given the current situation, but this can have a real effect on confined space, of course. And I just want to read the guidance notes of this bottle that I've got in front of me. Um, basically, it says it's highly flammable liquid and vapour. Keep away from heat, sparks, flames and hot surfaces. So I, I personally have seen this with, with a client about to go into a confined space. And I know Doug has had people on training courses come in with these attached to their belts. Naturally, the point here would be not to take them in with you. But as you know, we, <laughs> these people do take these things because they're such a part of our daily PPE. So for us, it's just a case of, guys, look, you need to be mindful that this can cause you a problem. There may not be an inherent risk in the confined space that you're entering. But by using these types of gel, you're certainly introducing one. Back back to that classification of spaces, guys. So when we're looking at that ACOP flow chart, are we introducing the hazard? Um, it, it, the the, the classification is great. You know, it gives us the opportunity to link it to training and link it to competence and link it to PPE. And from a company point of view, to link it to how much risk we're happy with before we sub it out to a specialist. Um, the second you, you you let your welders get into a space with half a pound of flammable liquid, um, there's going to be a bigger problem. Uh, if if that makes sense, we've we've been training across several different industries, not 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 just uh, you guys, but um, we, we've seen people go, ah, yeah, yeah, I'm doing that uh, se several times now when when they've been in tanks welding or when they've been in contaminated spaces potentially welding because they've got so used to carting it around site and because the the gel dispensers are everywhere on site, so they do this, they do this, then they do this which is not sensible. You know, very relevant point, because I think we, we all, between us all, I'm sure, on, on this, this call have these products either in our pocket bags or even on our belts. So it's very, very valid and um, certainly gives food for thought. So what I want to do on this next slide is, is so we talked about 
poisoning sensors in, in critical bits of PPE uh, safety equipment like gas monitors in confined space. So what this slide is, is just to give you a visualisation of the impact of a potentially poisoned sensor and how it really looks if, it's, if it isn't performing like it should or at all. So what we have um, essentially here is two people entering a confined space, both using gas detectors. One is fully functional and one has a poison sensor due to using alcohol as cleaner. So they both meet the gas at the same time. However, the fully functional monitor reacts first. So the red flash in there indicates that it's alarmed. So he is then able to react and exit the confined space, whereas the user with the poison sensor is still getting deeper into the toxic or invisible gas potentially within the confined space, leading to a potential fatal accident. I mean, let's say the response time is 10 seconds slower than normal. I suppose what we've got to ask ourselves is what are the implications of, of those extra seconds and what will we do in that, that period of time? I suppose the question is, you know, what, what will a 10 second head start mean to you? So that's quite a, a, a good visual to sort of give you an indication of, of the level of risk that you could be coming into, cap, into contact with considering the, uh, the poison sensors. And I guess, you know, we've chucked on for about 35 minutes and, you know, we're happy to take uh, some, some questions from you guys. I know we've got, you know, we said we'd do anywhere between 30 and, and 45 minutes. So more, more time for questions for, for Doug and myself would be, be great. Um, I have got one question that's come in through chat. Um, basically, and I'm just going to read it as it was kind of posted because <laughs> I'm not sure which part of the presentation it kind of referred to really. Um, are, basically, the question is, are you saying that if getting in a dryer or screen or hot bins, if they're allowed to cool down and the fan is left on to ventilate, it is not a confined space? If they are classified as confined spaces, what would you provide as an emergency procedure? And this is specifically relating to an asphalt plant. Okay, so so um, there's, there's three different entries there. So in a screen, if your screen's fully enclosed, then uh, you're, you're not, you are kind of increasing that risk. So usually with the screen, the enclosure will be dust enclosure or something like that. Now, if you open up the access port at the front end of it, and if you take off some of the enclosure points, why do you need to go in it? Why can't you take the top mats off and work your way down? What you're doing in the screen then is going to create your problem. Um, so are you, are you burning? Are you just doing a mechanical? Are you going to do a mechanical job? Your classification of the screen in operation is it's an operation. Would you want someone to climb into it in operation? No, 100% not. Don't go in there in operation because you're going to have a massive problem. But if it's not in operation, if it's properly shut down, if it's properly cold, um, if you've taken all of these adequate controls to go forward uh, and these adequate controls are in place, is it still the same thing it was when it was in operation? It's not, is it? It, uh, the other, I mean, a working example could be um, um, well, yeah, a petrol generator. A petrol generator in my living room with me now uh, is going to cause a problem, but only if it's switched on. Otherwise, it's just a petrol generator. Um, with with a dryer or with um, with your like on your bitumen plant where you've got something really really hot, really really hot process. Uh, if you go in there in the hot process, yeah, it's, it's a problem. But if it's not hot, where's the specified risk? Can it restart? If it can restart, there's the specified risk. If it's got a uh, legacy gas fume vapor, so again, bitumen, then maybe the, 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 the substance that's within it might, might give something else, so then that different gas fume vapor. Maybe it's still going to be um, covered by like the DC regs because it's, it's a flammable substance. So if you go in there and do certain work tasks, you're going to have a, a different problem, but it's all subject to that risk assessment. Uh, just because it's going to immediately kill you if it's red hot, if it's not red hot, it's a big metal tin with nothing in it. So that would be this idea of moving through classifications. You could move it from a, something that's immediately going to kill you to something that you just want to control people coming in and out of. Does, does that answer that? Um, I think I think there was a sort of slight follow up. So they're saying if it was a, a it's fully shut down, isolated, and cold, and it's just a mechanical screen change. Mm -hmm. That is or isn't a confined space? I, I wouldn't say that was a confined space. 
Okay, I think that answers the question then. Um, Will, do you want to unmute yourself? You said you want to answer a question, ask a question, yeah. and uh, Peter Mole, um, or likewise, to follow Will, please. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, Lee and Doug, I'm not quite sure who's best to answer this. It's again the classification, I suppose, and I've heard quite a bit about restricted access, and I just wondered how you would uh, differentiate between that and a confined space, please. Um, okay, so so restricted access would come in. Um, there's obviously places on site we don't want people in without some idea of what they're doing in there and, and, and you know having a sensible plan. It could be because it's a working at height task, climbing into somewhere. O often the guys are still climbing into machinery with ladders, uh, temporary ladders, because of the nature of the machine, it, you know, handrails and the ladders and fixed rungs and stuff aren't going to survive in a crusher or something like that. Um, so they have to arrange temporary access to be able to get in. Um, the temporary access itself is leading to a problem. That problem requires a rescue response um, or an emergency response if the problem's realized. So we have to control entry to that space. We don't, we don't want somebody just wandering in there under any terms, restricted space. If the specified risk is likely to occur, reasonably foreseeable to occur, confined space. The only real difference is there's some confined space controls through the ACOP uh, that wouldn't exist on some of the other jobs. Um, where, where the problem comes in reverse is when we overclassify and everything's a confined space all the time. Well, the lads can see it's not. And then they don't take it really seriously. So the idea of a permit to work and a permit controlled space is th this is a bit tricky, guys. We need to switch on when we do this job. It's not a standard job. Uh, we're not just going to apply standard controls. There's risk involved. Happy with that? Doug, if I could just come back in. Sorry, that was my question earlier about the um, the asphalt plant. Yeah, hi, Rob. Um, I've had to come back in on my phone. I, I tend to uh, just watch them on the on the home computer with, just so I can enjoy the the main screen. Um, yeah, just just come back because I suppose it's it's perception of what is confined space, and in the past, a lot of the time, it's almost been over risk assessed, if you like, to the mm. point where um, we're being asked. What if you um, bump your head or sort of you're unable to get out under your own steam um, so, or a heart attack or something? And, and it's we, we, we look at that as mechanism of injury. So if we're going to climb 10 foot into a space, the mechanism of injury is a 10 foot fall. Yeah. So for a 10 foot fall, you, you could snap your foot off the bottom of your leg or you could have some kind of horrendous mechanical injury off the bottom of that. If you're walking in on a flat level surface and you've got adequate head protection, uh, and you've been instructed to walk slowly, maybe. Um, what's what's the mechanism of injury? It's a bumped head with adequate head protection. You're probably going to go out and turn around and walk back out. So the idea that you're going to need a break-in team and neck stabilisation and, and all this good stuff, maybe not. Um, it, it's the same with RPE, isn't it? It's the same when, when we've got somebody working on an airline uh, in a confined space. We might still leave a gas monitor in there to see what the conditions are within the space or nearby to make sure that we're not affecting another space. But we wouldn't necessarily be too worried if the, the EH40 five parts per million or 20 parts per million carbon monoxide alarm went off because the chap's working on an airline. Yeah. So that wouldn't necessarily be a, a big worry for me because, because of the controls I've already got in place. In terms of rescue, well, the guy can just get up and walk out because he's on an airline. So that's the thing. With the medical question, I've heard that one a lot. Now, we should be making sure that people we put into confined spaces are working at height and medically fit enough to do so. So when, when it's the oldest person on site that's, that's being maintained, you know, it's, it's still got a job because they're the only one that fits, possibly that's not the right approach. Possibly we should engineer the hole to be a bit bigger so we can, we can send you know, a younger person in or a fitter person in or someone that's been pre-health checked to be able to go and do that job. And that would apply as well for anyone that you're going to use maybe to recover somebody from a difficult space if they had that fall or if they had that, you know, that foreseeable accident. I think a lot of it comes down to sort of getting back to the manufacturers and design as well. Because of course. Of yeah, of course. Yeah, and I think a lot of the plants that I've been to over the years, I mean, they're getting better. When, when we first started in the industry, sort of 15 years ago, um, a lot of the sites were just death traps. 
Um, but, but now most of the problems that we saw on the initial tranche of visits and the initial tranche of working with the guys that we were, we were involved with um, have been engineered out. So rather than having the sort of legacy um, risk, if you like, from the 70s, um, it's gone. It, it's, not, it's not the same thing that it was. The plants aren't the same thing as they were. I mean, take, take working at Hyde, for example. Uh, the access to different platforms via vertical ladders are being engineered out. Most people are putting in stairs. And that's, that's great. Now you're accessing to and from platform via a permanent staircase rather than getting people to climb up, you know, frosty, dirty sites on vertical ladders. The, f- the favourite one is the uh, is the dryer, because just by its nature, there's, there's not many uh, ways in and out. Of course. Now, again, I've seen that fixed as well, where they've rolled the motor back. So they've, they've actually rolled the burner back from one end so you can just walk in. Yeah. Uh, so rather than access, accessing down a feed chute, they've just moved the motor back and then you can just walk in. I've seen that. I've seen that done on a lot of sites. I've seen it done um, where the cover over the feed chute on a screen rolls back, and then they drop in some uh, full protection, so so the, 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 where the the rubble goes or where the product goes is blocked, and then the guys can just walk into the bottom of the screen. Then you haven't got a work in a height problem. It's all open. You haven't got a confined space problem. It just makes the work quicker. But you have to introduce the control before you go to work. So that that involves upskilling the managers and getting the managers to look at it slightly different. Yeah, yeah, and I think also it's um, just re-educating some of the, uh, the health and safety departments um, to uh, accept you know this, this new approach. Well, I say not a new approach, but um, much more. You know, you're looking at it from the foreseeable risk point of view and being able to then deal with each one of those. Um, yeah, it's really bad. I mean, even if we're going to call it a confined space, the confined space regs sort of explicitly state that, that we've got to reduce the risk almost to zero before we can put somebody in there anyway. So as part and process of that, if we're getting that risk down to, to zero, then, then we're all kind of moving along that target zero pathway where we're not going to have those accidents anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was obviously picking up on the similar point about restricted access um, that the previous gentleman mentioned. Um, obviously, from a business point of view, the survey of your confined space restricted access at the outset is critical to actually understand whether it is a confined space or a restricted access. And whether or not, if a restricted aspect, as, uh, a restricted access then turns into a confined space by the other introduction of things like welding, hot works, all that sort of thing. So the survey is the critical part of this. 100%. Um, and again, from a business point of view, it's important that health and safety teams realize it's not all just about confined space, it's restricted access is the first point. And then you move through the confined space hierarchy of controls, as you've already alluded to in your presentation. So. That was all really, I just wanted yeah, to Yeah, what one hundred percent, Peter. And and you're absolutely right. I mean, any enclosed space has got the potential if you introduce the if you introduce the hazard. So it, it's just surveying these spaces in their normal operating, you know, in their normal operating state. Yeah, absolutely. So the survey for me is a critical path to actually getting the right controls in place going forward. Yeah. And a lot of people fail on the survey part. They go straight into confined space rather than thinking about it a little bit. Yes. Uh, yes, hundred percent. Okay, thank you. I've got a further question that's come in on the chat um, that basically is asking the question, is there anything being done on educating people on confined spaces generally outside of the workplace and industry, increased use of basements for home working as an example? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. It's, it's not something I've come across because uh, all, all the regulation is when you're at work. But yeah, it's a fair point. Thank you very much, Lee. I don't know whether you're still with us, Lee. I think you had a few problems through the technical issues going on. Um, but thank you, both Lee and Doug. That was a really interesting uh, technical presentation. I particularly got a lot out of it. And all that remains really is to, to, to thank everyone and wish you all a good weekend.